Hello everyone, welcome to another video. In this video we're going to take a look at exponential functions. But before we get started and get into the mathematical part of things, I obviously would like to motivate this discussion based on current events and what's going on. Uh, because I'm sure as you've been following the news with the spread of COVID-19 and the reason why now we have to continue this course remotely, among other things, is because the spread of uh, the virus has what we call, and people keep saying this, has exponential growth. And everybody's telling you, you know, in the news, everywhere you go, hey, watch out, because this grows exponentially. So this spreads exponentially. Like it's the scariest thing in the world. Well, this is a chance for us to actually understand all that and give you also a little bit more background about this and then tie it to the math that you learn in this course. Uh, so this is an opportunity to tie the regular curriculum of algebra to current events. So you have, you have a way in real life to tie the information that you're learning in this section and understand it better. And if I can succeed in helping you do that, then I then we can uh, then you will benefit a lot from this video. So that's what I'm hoping to achieve through this video. And of course, it's important for you to know how to do the math part, but also to have a better intuition and understanding of what exponential growth even means. Right. Because the other thing you probably notice any if you've been following the news or following uh, daily reports on on the number of cases and everything. One thing they don't do, you probably notice, the part that they show to the public, they do not show math, right? There's a reason behind that, because a lot of people are scared of math. A lot of people, as soon as they see mathematics or see graphs, it, you know, they get scared, they get intimidated, it brings, a, it brings back anxiety from when they took math and maybe they really hated math. So unfortunately, there are a lot of people who have an aversion to mathematics and because of that, uh, there is a problem. What's the problem? The problem is this leaves people uneducated about what all this stuff means. So it, be, so it becomes like a bag of mysteries. When a doctor comes up and says, we have to flatten the curve, most people don't know what this doctor is talking about, right? Uh, when, when a doctor or the CDC representative shows up and says, we need to make sure that we take these extra measures uh, or these extreme measures to uh, to flatten the curve, to reduce the exponential growth. Again, most people don't fully understand the math part of things. And because of that, a lot of people start coming up with their own theories or their own ideas of whether to take this seriously, whether this is not a big deal or whether this is some kind of conspiracy theory or whether this... And that's a problem. So again, if you're armed with the understanding and the education, you can always make a better interpretation of what's going on around you. If you don't have that full understanding and knowledge of what's going on behind the scenes, then and, and you only listen to experts and that information is kind of hidden from you, then it makes it very difficult and it leaves it open to conjecture and everybody can come up with their own theory and everybody will come up with their own uh, cause or reason of why we're doing this. And, and then it becomes a disaster. So this is again an opportunity for us to learn math, but also maybe help us and help everybody understand exactly the scenario we're enduring through the lens of understanding mathematics. All right, so again, I wanted to start with this because I didn't want to jump straight into the math and then uh, you lose that connection. So I wanted you to start with the connection. All right, so the first thing I want to mention is some interesting things that come from science and from biology, right? So in any biological system, if you put a living organism in an environment where it can thrive, so if you take some kind of organism and you put it in an environment where it can thrive, it can find food, it can find unlimited resources, no predators to kill it or eat it, no competitors, it will grow, it will always grow in the same fashion, exponentially. 
So again, remember this. Any, any organism, if you put it in an environment where it can thrive, without any direct predators or competitors, it will grow exponentially, right? So as long as those conditions are met, everything from wolves to parasitic uh, wasps to yeast cells, you name it, any organism will grow exponentially. It will keep doing that up until one of those assumptions fails to be true. So either the environment does not sustain it anymore, or the food runs out, or you introduce some kind of predator or competitor that eats the food or, or kills that organism. So if you change one of those conditions, you're going to alter that growth. You're going to break that cycle of a exponential growth. You're going to stop it, right? So if you don't do anything, then it's going to continue to take its natural path, which is to grow exponentially. Okay, so what does growing exponentially even mean? Okay, so, uh, so let's take uh, again the example of the corona, uh, the coronavirus, right? So the coronavirus. So we have the coronavirus, which, by the way. Uh, the coronavirus is not called COVID-19. COVID-19 is actually the name of the illness that you get from the coronavirus, right? So COVID-19 is the actual illness. The pathogen itself is not called, corona it's called the coronavirus, but it has its own like special kind. There, there are two, of, there are several different kinds of coronavirus. This is they call it, you probably heard people refer to this as the novel coronavirus because it's a new one. It's a, it's a strand that we haven't seen before, right? So we've seen some other strains of coronavirus that are not as malicious as this one or as they don't spread as fast, right? But this one is a different one. It has a more complicated medical uh, uh, acronym, uh, but that's not the one that the public, they use for the public. For the public, they just say coronavirus, um, and they they have the COVID-19 is the name of the disease, and again, that was because it was discovered when it first occurred in China in December uh, 2019. All right, so let's take the, let's see if we can understand uh, the simple thought experiment and see if we can understand what exponential growth means and how it works. So in, in the case of COVID-19, Exponential growth will occur in the disease, in the, if, in the disease rate uh, in humans, so long as, again, we need similar assumptions to what we talked uh, about earlier. So you have to, to have some kind of things that will make it thrive. So what are the things that this disease or illness likes? Okay, well, you have to have you have to start with somebody infected. Right, so you have to have at least one infected person. So you need at least one infected person. Okay, the second condition is you have to make sure that you, there's some kind of regular contact between infected and uninfected members of the population. So there's contact between infected and uninfected members of the population. And the third important uh, uh, condition is that there are a large number of uninfected potential hosts among the population. So there are large numbers of uninfected hosts. So this is basically what this coronavirus likes. 
So if you make sure that these three conditions are met, the coronavirus will grow, will spread. How's that spread again? What's the rate of that spread? How is it going to spread? It's going to spread exponentially. Okay, given these three conditions, the virus will spread exponentially. And here we are again, we're throwing that word around a lot. Exponentially. We still haven't explained what that means. We're going to do it shortly. But at least now we're understanding when that happens. So, so do you guys already see, now you're already thinking like a, an a epidemiologist, you're already thinking, okay, how do I stop this thing, right? Oh, okay, so if I want to stop it, I need to break one of these conditions at least. So typically what, what epidemiologists do in these situations, they don't try to attack only one of these conditions, they try to attack many of them. So they try to find the, where the infection started, and they try to treat the source there. They also try to take care of this part because once it, it, it spread to other populations in different parts of the world, then it becomes very difficult to isolate and contain. So you start tackling the second condition, which is reduce contact between people that you know are infected and people that are not infec uh, infected. So you have, so this is the part, so the kind of stuff we're doing, like we're not having face-to-face -face classes and you're doing social isolation and they invented this phrase where they're telling you to do social isolation, stay six feet from uh, other people and so on and don't visit anybody and don't get out of your house and, and all these what seems to be draconian measures. But when you start reading this and understanding how viruses spread, you can start to see why this makes sense, right? So. So what we're doing is really dealing with the second condition. We're trying to reduce contact between infected and uninfected. And obviously the third condition is something we can't necessarily control. But if it's true, it's going to keep the virus going, right? Because the virus, so, so think of it this way. Let me give you this like scenario. So let's say the virus started in a house household and people and this person did not get out of the house and family members quickly realized this person had the virus so they they got uh they contacted the emergency they took this person to the hospital they took precautions to make sure that this person is isolated and quarantined and they checked the family members none of them had the virus and they quarantined them and then they started treating uh, those infected and got and treated them successfully and they recovered. In that scenario, the virus did not get, in, get a chance to get in contact with people that, that are uninfected. So it got contained very quickly and you didn't have a large number of people around that the virus can jump to large number of people who are uninfected that the that the virus can jump from one to the next from one to the next one to the next so the virus will eventually get you know it will not grow exponentially and it will get contained or get destroyed right uh, but the problem with this virus by the way is which which made it very difficult uh, to detect is that there's a there's a incubation period of about five days so what does that mean? That means when you get the virus, you, it will take three to five days before you, your body even notices that you have the virus, right? So this virus is very stealthy. Then it takes about 14 days as your immune system is fighting this virus. It takes about 14 days before you actually start to see some major symptoms. So that's why they've been trying to tell people stay in your home for two weeks or whatever, because if you don't show symptoms after those two weeks, then you probably, you probably don't have the virus. 
right? Uh, but if you start to show even some mild symptoms, then they can test you and they can find the virus. But again, the testing itself, by the way, I don't want to get too much into the medical side of things here, but the testing itself is a little tricky if you guys did a little bit of research of this or heard about this or read about this. The problem is the virus in initially obviously is going to latch onto somebody via the mouth or the eyes or the nose because you touch something with your hands. That's why they're telling everybody touch to wash their hands. And then you touch your face and that's how you get the virus. But then it will make its way to your lungs. So a lot of the tests that they do are tests where they just check th in your throat. So they can check to see, uh, check your throat, check your mouth, and they can see traces of the virus there. The problem is you could do that at the beginning, but once the virus makes its way to your lungs, you cannot, that test does not tell you. That test can, cannot tell you for certain if that person has the virus or not, unless the person coughs up some stuff that's a, that shows the infection and you can actually test that. The only way you would be able to test is if you either scan, uh, do like, uh, an x-ray of the chest and see the lungs to see how uh, whether they, the lungs are inflamed or not or they also do more intrusive tests where they can bring take a tube put it down your throat and then they can go deep and check your uh, they can check your lungs that way the problem with that obviously is that something like that can only be done at a health facility so you couldn't go around in the public and test people in the streets that way. The only test that they could do in the streets or in a mobile unit would be the quick tests where they can just check your throat and check uh, in your mouth and check your, your obvious s symptoms that you might have like fever and maybe cough, stuff like that. But, it, but, they, but again, that's not fail safe. Uh, safe you know? So they could get that wrong, especially after the virus migrates down to your lungs. So because of that, we're talking two weeks to three weeks before anybody notices that they actually are sick. And if they don't get really bad, then they may not even bother to go to the hospital or go to the emergency. And so during this time, they actually have the virus and they can spread it to other people. So again, this goes back to the second bullet, which is you've got contact between people who are infected even though they may not even know it. They may think it's, you know, common flu or common cold and uh, people who are uninfected. And that's part of the problem because there's a large number of people that may just show mild symptoms and, and, and they will just shake this thing off and they think, okay, we're going to be okay. But the problem is during that time, they could have infected so many people and there are so many more people who would be uh, very vulnerable and uh, where the virus again because it's very quick the way it spreads <clears throat> the virus will hurt a lot more people that way uh, even if it doesn't hurt everybody so that's why the biggest the, the big deal was about social distancing and social isolation self-isolation social distancing uh, and that's why we don't have face-to-face -face classes, which again, seems like a, an inconvenience for a lot of people and everybody. But, you know, this is important because what we're doing is to make sure that you're still getting your education, but we're also saving lives in the process. And we're hoping that we'll get through this all together and, and then things will eventually get back to normal. We just have to um, stay strong and stay positive and uh, do our best to help one another and support one another and do the right thing which is even uh, in situations like this the most important thing is not to be selfish just, just think oh i don't care because i don't get the virus or if i get the virus i'm not going to get that sick anyways but you know you could spread it to other people who would get really sick and uh, and that could end their life so again it is a big deal so this is really an opportunity for most people and societies and the world as a whole to do some soul uh, searching and try to help one another and unite against this common enemy, which is this uh, deadly virus. All right. So again, how does exponential growth work? So assuming that all three of these conditions are there, um, 
you probably noticed there's a lot of flicker in here. That's something that has to do with this mirroring app that I'm using through my iPad to mirror this to a computer screen. Sometimes it works fine, sometimes it flickers. I've done everything I could do to re reduce the flickering and I'm not even sure why it does it. And sometimes it seems like to stop doing it, sometimes it just starts doing it. I'm gonna try something else. I'm gonna change the view here and I'm gonna mirror my the whole screen instead of mirroring the actual presentation part. So the annoying thing about this, you get to see this menu and all that. Uh, well, we could, let's see if I can reduce that. Maybe see that better. But let's see if that takes care of the flicker. That will make it easier. All right, so assuming these three conditions are there or are true, the virus is gonna, as, as we said, will take its own natural path of growth, which is an exponential growth. So let's take a little scenario. This is a little uh, thought experiment, an exercise, which will, again, help you understand how this uh, virus has spread. So, for example, uh, we said, obviously, we have exponential growth. So whenever we have exponential growth, whatever it is that's growing, will double its presence or population in a given amount of time. So whenever you have an exponential growth, whatever is growing. So in this case, we're, we're tracking the, the spread of the virus. So what's growing could be like the number of people infected or the number of cases, which is what the, the medical uh, folks like to, to call. So the number of cases or number of patients or number of infected. So that's going to grow exponentially. What does that mean? Well, that means it's going to keep doubling every so often. So maybe it will double every month or double every three days or it will double every four days or it will double every week. And how soon that happens, the shorter the period of time, the faster the, uh, the virus is in terms of spreading. So if something, so if the number of infected doubles every five days versus every seven days, then you know that that virus that uh, that doubles every five days is going to be much more dangerous virus than the virus that doubles every uh, seven days, right? So so again, that's called a rate of spread or rate of uh, infection. But typically, anytime you have some kind of exponential growth. One way to understand it is basically the number of cases is going to double every so often. Okay, so that so let's take a look at uh, a nice a nice easy scenario to think of this. So let's say January first. So again, I need my pen. So January first. Oh, I guess I lose my pen when I do that. All right, so I have to keep it. So January first. say of this year, let's say we had um, one person was infected. And let's say by tracking this virus, people learned that uh, the number of infected people doubles every three days. Number of infected doubles every three days. So here we are, you're a doctor and you're trying to understand this. The question you'd like to answer is, how many people will be infected by January 31st. That's a very good question. So given this information, you know that on January 1st, one person was infected and the number of people who are infected doubles every three days. Using that information, can you tell me how many people 
will be infected by January 31st. So this is a good time for you to pause the video, try this nice thought experiment on your own and come up with a number and then resume the video when you're ready to see uh, the answer I come up with. All right, welcome back. I hope that you tried to answer that question on your own and came up with a number. So let's see what I can come up with here. So we said January 1st, there's one person, okay? So if you wait three days, it's gonna be double, right? So after three days, it's gonna go, oh, we said, um, did we say double? Yeah, so double, so it'll be one times two, which will be two. Okay, wait another three days. Three days later. So that's six, six days after January 1st. So you could, you could call that January 7th or something, but, but let's go ahead and compute the number. So it's going to be what? It's going to be the double of the number that you had. So if we had two after three days infected, then that number is going to double three days later. So it's going to be two times two, which would give you four. Okay, we have to keep going. How about three days later? You're gonna take the four and you double it again. So you get eight. So you're starting to see how this is gonna play out, right? But am I gonna keep doing this until I get to January 31st? That will take me a while. Well, the good news, the smart way of doing this is to find a pattern. And if you can guess what the pattern is, you can get that answer a lot quicker. So let's see if we can track it slightly better. So January 1st, it's one person. January Fourth. That's after three days. We said it's two. Right? It's two times one. January seventh. Well, that's after six days. six days from January 1st. So that's gonna be, we said two times two, which is four. So that's two times two times one. Okay, we're starting to see maybe some kind of pattern here that we can use to our advantage. Okay, let's see. January, let's do a few more and then you'll start to see it. January 10th, so remember, that's how many days after January 1st? That's after nine days. That's going to be eight, which is two times two times two times one. Okay, maybe, some, maybe this will help. I could think of this as one times two to the power one. This will be one times two to the power two. This is one times two to the power three. Okay, you guys starting to see a pattern here? So how about January uh, 13th, which is 12 days afterwards, after January 1st? Well, you're going to double the 8, so you're going to get 16. But 16 can be written as 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 1, or 1 multiplied by 2 to the power 4. All right, here's what I'd like for you to think about. Is there a way to tie this formula 
more precisely this exponent to this number here how many days later if you can do that you crack the code of this growth and then we'll be able to tell immediately what the answer is going to be after uh, uh, on January 31st okay if you can tell it here let's look at the previous one so when this is 3 this here is 9 when this is 2 this here is 6 when this here is 1 this here is 3 here is here is some help think of 6 is 2 times 3 think of 9 is 3 times 3 think of 12 is 4 times 3. Okay, see a match now? Whatever multiple of 3 the number of days is, that's exactly what shows up in the exponent here. So when this is 4, this is 4. When this is 3, this is 3. When this is 2, this is 2. Uh huh, do you guys see that? So the exponent is the number of days after January 1st divided by 3. Now again, why is it divided by 3? Because that's how often it doubles. So it doubles every 3 days. So now that you see that, can you tell me what the answer is going to be for January 31st? First of all, January 31st is how many days after January 1st? That's 30 days later. And 30 days is basically 10 times 3. So according to the pattern that we just discovered, we expect to have 1 times 2 to the power 10 infected. If you take 2 to the power 10, by the way, 2 to the power 4 is 16. 2 to the power 5 is 16 doubled, so that's 32. 2 to the power 6 is 32 doubled, which is 64. 2 to the power 7 is 128. 2 to the power 8 is 256. 2 to the power 9 is 512. 2 to the power 10 is 1024. There you have it. We just witnessed exponential growth. Now, to, e to even put it in perspective, I could write these answers in sequence. So here's, here's the number of, of infected every three days. It's one on the first day, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, and keeps doubling. When you get to 30 days later, this is on day, this is 30 days later. It's going to be 1,024. By the way, if you ever like, you know, if you like zombie movies and those kind of stuff, there was a movie called, I think, uh, many years ago called 28 Days Later, <laughs> a British movie, which is kind of about the reason they called it 28 Days Later is because supposedly, again, exponential growth. So the zombie infection started on day one. And by the time it was 28 days later, basically the human population was all zombified. Okay. Uh, there was only a small minority trying to survive. So again, that's because the infection spreads so quickly and exponentially that it doesn't take long to jump from 1 to 1,024, even with this really simple example that we just looked at. So, of course, you can keep this going. If you actually continue this pattern, you could, you could guess, or you could uh, not guess, but you could come up with an answer for what the number of infected will be by this year's equinox, which was March 19, right? So, if you, so which was last week. And if you do that, I actually did the calculation. So, uh, I actually did it on different days on... On, on February 3rd, it, it becomes 2024. 
on February 6, it will go to 4096. Because remember, it doubles every three days, right? If you keep going at this doubling rate of every three days, by the time you get to March 19, so remember, we started on January 1st with just one person infected. And we, and we were working under the assumption that this doubles every three days, which is actually the rough rate of doubling of this. By the time you get to uh, March 19th, can you guys take a, a guess, ballpark, on how many people would be infected March 19? All right, I'm going to scare you here. If you could, if we could, uh, if you could, if I could hear you, I would play the higher and lower game, right? You give me a guess and I tell you if it's high, you should go higher or lower, right? So, uh, the number of people that would be infected following our little model here, simple model that we're doing of exponential growth of COVID-19 would be 67 million people. That's, by the way, how many days? That's 78 days. That's 78 days after uh, January 1st. Now, if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what would. That scares me. Now, do you see how the math can help you understand exponential growth and can also help you understand the seriousness of um, what this means for us, for a human population fighting a new virus, right? Yeah. That we don't have a cure for yet and we don't have a good treatment for it yet. So... So what's the only weapon we have? Well, limit its, re uh, its, its resources and its raison d'etre, right? The French have a great saying, raison d'etre. Raison d'etre is a uh, reason to exist, right? So you want to get rid of this virus, you need to eliminate the things that make it thrive. And out of those things, there are certain things we can control and certain things we can't. We can't control that there are a lot of people uninfected. In fact, we want it that way. We don't want everybody infected. So this part here, we can't do much with that. But we, and we can't control the first person that was infected. That's now water under the bridge. We just have to treat the people that are infected and try to contain it from infecting uh, a large number of people and killing a lot of people. So the second one is the part that we can control. And if we can control that, we can actually um, eventually overcome this big crisis. All right, what you just witnessed, by the way, here is exponential growth. And this formula here that we just came up with, I could actually write it to mimic something we're more comfortable with. I could write it as a function, right? So I could say, oh, I don't want to have, uh, because I could have given you another date. I could have said, can you tell me by uh, April 15, what will be the number of people infected if you continue working with this model that we just came up with? By the way, what we just did here is mathematical modeling. Mathematical modeling is means using mathematics to write formulas to help you understand the behavior and predict the future behavior and predict future outcome for a system. That system could be theoretical, that system could be uh, physical, that could be biological. So here we're modeling a spread of an epidemic, right? This is the beauty of mathematics. You know, a lot of times people will tell you, or most people say, oh, I hate math because, you know, it, uh, where where are you ever going to use it? Well, here is a perfect example where math is making a difference between us living or not. I mean, what else do you need? <laughs> this is a perfect example to show you how important uh, math is. Understanding the math literally can save your life in a situation like this. And we're glad to have our lives in in the hands of people, scientists who are doing this using the mathematical models to try to understand how bad 
things are and how to prevent them from getting bad. Okay, so mathematics is crucial and this is the beautiful part of mathematics. It's not just about doing algebra for the sake of algebra, but it's doing mathematics to understand real life problems and solve real life problems, right? So this is mathematical modeling. So this is an example of how math applies to the health sector, right? And I know some of you may be majoring in uh, health sciences. This is relevant to you, you know? You don't think that, oh, I'm just going into health sciences. I don't need math or I don't care. I'll never need math again ever. Well, no, mistake, big mistake. Because this is exactly the math that's used in the health sciences. The math of estimation, the math of prediction, the math of modeling cases. So many areas of uh, health sciences and biology use mathematics to understand biological systems and phenomena and, and pro protein interaction and even drug interaction. All those things can be modeled mathematics. So instead of running away from math, you want to learn it. You want to understand it and you want to embrace it as a weapon because guess what? A lot of people are not good at it. A lot of people hate math. So if you actually embrace it and learn it, you will stand out. Because when you go get a job and there's a situation, tough problem that you have to crack using mathematics, and other people are gonna run away from that problem, you'll be the one going toward the problem and you'll be the one to solve it. So math, again, can empower you and make you uh, stand out and do well and help others. So. Let's see if we can write a formula because guess what? Because in real life, you'd like a formula. Because if you're right now working for the CDC and you're trying to stop this disease, and the spread of this disease, you'd like a formula so you can use it to tell people after so many days, how many should we expect? Because people are trying to make decisions to plan ahead. How long should we close the schools? How long should we tell people to stay home? How long should we uh, have all these strict measures? You know, some countries have curfews. People can't get out of their house, right? So how long should they do this? Well, they need to have a glimpse of the future. You can't get a glimpse of the future. We're not um, time travelers. The only way you can get a glimpse of the future is using mathematical models to, to help you predict what's going to happen. Now, there's a big uh, important thing, though, to keep in mind. Mathematical models are as good as the data you feed in them. So if your data is crappy and if your assumptions are not sound, your results are not reliable. So always keep that in mind. The other important thing is that in real life, there are way too many variables. So you can't make a formula that takes into account every single cause or factor that's involved in what, what you're trying to study. So your model is always going to be a simplification of reality. But as long as your model captures the important factors and it relies on good data, then you can rely on the predictions made by your model. So that's what scientists do. Data science is all about learning how to perfect these models based on data to end this to, to use them to predict things. And of course, a lot of people make forecasts that are wrong sometimes, like in, uh, especially in the stock market and other places, because their model was wrong, because they fed wrong data or they made wrong assumptions. Again, they're not always perfect, but the better the data, the better the model. The better the data and the assumptions in your model, the better. So let's write a formula. That's called the model, the exponential model. So I'm going to call it n of t so n of t is number of infection or number of infected after t days we have a formula it's going to be one because that's how many infected we started with times two because it doubles every three days to the power what well, the power changes, right? The power is here. Here is one. The power here is two. The power here is three. Well, how did we get those numbers? Those numbers were not the actual number of days. 
those numbers were the number of days divided by three, right? So when it was six days, this is a two. That's because six divided by three is two. When it was nine days later, this is three. So nine divided by three is three. When it was 12 days, this is four, right? So let's generalize it. So if it's t days later, because we're, we're trying to come up with a formula for any number of days, that we can plug in any number of days and get the answer. The exponent will be t over 3. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that formula. That, we got, you, you got yourself now a, an introduction to becoming a scientist. You just wrote, you just came up with your first model. And not only that, this is a model for studying the spread of COVID-19. Now keep in mind what I said earlier, we didn't use much data to build this model and we used some really simple assumptions. Of course, the models that are that the folks from the CDC and the folks that are informing uh, the uh, administration and other places higher up to decide things have much more sophisticated models and I'm going to show you a glimpse of that and uh, and obviously the the formulas will be much more complicated it's higher level math but this gives you a glimpse so this gives you an idea of how this stuff begins right so this is a nice way for you to understand this now guess what this is a function instead of x I'm using t because it, because the number of days is represents time and this is the formula for it. Notice where the t goes. The t is in the exponent. That's why this is this function here is called an exponential function. This is an exponential function. And this typically in science when they're using this for a good reason to understand something happens, what, uh, how something behaves or what, what's the future or the prediction, predict the outcome in the future, they don't like to use the word function. They just call it model. So they say this is an exponential model because it's a model, which means it's a mathematical formula to model the behavior of what you're studying. But it happens to be an exponential formula. So we call it an exponential model. So that's where all this word, these words that you hear in the news and other places come from. And of course, when you have an exponential model, it's going to exhibit exponential growth. Now, let me take you a step further. Let's chart the information we just had. So just to kind of give you a glimpse of the coolness of this. You can tell I'm really excited about this stuff. I like this stuff. I think you like it too, because again, it empowers you. Knowledge is power. It helps you understand what happens in real life. And like I said, a lot of people run away from math. If you don't run away from it, it gives you an advantage. So this is T. I'm gonna make a T axis, that's time. So notice I'm not using the regular X axis because in real life, you typically study in things how they change with respect to time. Time is the big variable. So time replaces the X. So instead of the X axis, I'm using a T axis. T is time here. And the vertical axis is your function. Your function, we typically use F of X, but here we're calling it N because it's a number of infected. And it's a function of t, not x, so we put n of t. So, But again, you can still think of this. This is like your y value, right? So what do we know? We know that when t equals to, let me see if I can write a little table here. So we have t, and we have n of t, and at t equals 0, First day, one person infected. So how about, uh, what did you say, how long it takes to double? Three days later, two. How about another three days later, so six days later? 
this will be 4. Then 9 days later, this will be 8. Then 12 days later, this will be 16. Oops. So this is 16. And there you have it. You've got yourself a little table. Let's plot these points. Now, at 0, we're going to go up to 1. I'm going to put a dot there. At uh, 3, so let's say this is 1, 2, 3. I'm going to go up to 2. At 6, so this is 4, 5, 6. I'm going to go up to 4. If you go to 7, 8, 9, so this is 9, this is 6, this is 3, this is 0. So at 9, we're going to double the previous number, so we're going to get to 8. Oh, look where that goes. Do you guys see the interesting thing going on here? Look at that. That's exponential growth. It starts low, and then it takes off. I could actually join these points to kind of get a trend of this. Look at that. The graph of this function. Wow. Now, let me remind you of a couple of things here. This is called exponential growth. So you see how the curve kind of curves and gets steeper very quickly? What makes it fast? What makes it fast is really the slope, right? The slope of this curve. Well, we know how to do a slope of a line. So if I gave you, let me do this here. If I gave you a line like that, that's linear growth. So that's something growing in a linear fashion along a straight line. So this is linear growth. When you have linear growth, when you have a line, the slope stays the same. So slope is constant. And the slope, by the way, is the rate of change. Slope is rate of growth. So what does that mean? That means how fast, how fast the number of infected will be growing as t is growing. So think of it as speed. How fast is the number of people getting infected? So if you wanted to write the slope for this medical application here, the, the epidemiology application here, it will be the it will be number of infected, the unit of it will be number of infected per day, if we're measuring every, uh, uh, the unit of time, T in days, right? But when you have exponential growth, because it's not a straight line, this rate here, this slope changes. Not, not just changes, look what happens. Let's draw a few slopes so you see the drastic change here. So if you're down here, if you're in this like little portion here, look at the slope is kind of tilted this way, right? If I go a few days later, the slope is already starting to tilt this way. And remember, when you have a line, the steeper it goes, the higher the slope. So, so if you have a line this way versus this way, this line here has slope M2, this line has slope M1, M2 is steeper than M1. So this line grows faster than this line. Okay. So the more this tilts upward, the faster it becomes. And it keeps tilting until it almost becomes vertical. When you have a vertical line, what kind of slope does it have mathematically? infinite. We say undefined, but that's because it's an infinite number. So it's going to, to, it's growing indefinitely. So this is trying to become as large as it can. It's trying to tilt until it becomes vertical, even though it doesn't reach the vertical. It doesn't fully become vertical, but it's trying to get there. So the farther you go, 
the more this tilts and gets closer to a vertical. So what does that mean? Let's think about that for a second. Remember what we said these slopes are. These slopes are number of infected per day. That's how fast the number of infected per day is. So the speed itself is growing. I want you to think about that for a second. The rate of change, how fast the infection is spreading itself, is growing. That's why exponential growth is relentless, is scary. Because it's not the number of infected alone that's getting big. It's how fast that number of infected is growing itself is getting faster. Oh my God, that so, sounds so scary. I want you to think about that for a second. That means, for example, at the beginning, you, you may, you may uh, be having people infected, five people getting infected every day. But the more people get infected and the more days pass, that could grow to seven people getting infected every day. And as that takes up, takes off and starts growing, the number of people getting infected, farther inward in, in time, you're going to find maybe that number goes up to 10 people are getting infected every day. And the more people get infected, the higher, the faster that grows. So do you guys see why Spain went from one day to another day, 800 people died in one day, in 24 hours? And you know, uh, uh, Italy, I should say. And then uh, Spain also had something close to 800 people. But several days before that, it was only 400 people. That's because every day, the speed at which people are dying and the speed at which people are getting infected itself is getting faster. Do you guys see why this is scary? Do you guys see why people are taking it seriously? Again, the... The only people that don't take it seriously are the people who don't understand this. Once you understand this, then you become like every mathematician, completely resigned to the fact that this is a horrible thing, right? Because you know what's coming. And that's what the scientists and the people who study this know what's coming. So that's why they feel strange because they feel like they're screaming off the top of their lungs to everybody this is serious take it seriously this is scary this is because they everybody understands this and once you understand the simple college algebra math about what exponentials what exponential growth means then you fully understand the seriousness of the situation you don't have to be to have a doctorate in epidemiology or you have to be a data scientist to understand all this this is enough to help you understand the seriousness of the situation. And now you guys understand it. So now you can educate your friends, you can educate family members, you can explain it to other people and it will help you understand this concept itself, yourself even better. The best way to understand something, to learn it, is to explain it to somebody else. All right, so let's now get to the rest of our lesson. So, uh, so this was all kind of just to give you a, a nice <laughs> current event centric way of understanding um, exponential functions. So this is a nice way, I think, to end this first video. I'm going to do a follow up video, which will focus on the math part a little bit more and we'll get into the simpler things. But I think this was really a motivational uh, video to help you understand exponential growth in real life and how it applies and i think it was an opportunity based on this what we're facing these days to help to help you see it through that lens so if any nice side benefit of this crisis we're living in is to help everybody learn better and understand better what exponential growth even means okay so i'll leave you with that and uh, um, be sure to fo watch the follow-up video because that's where i'm gonna actually get to the stuff that relates straight to your exercises and homework and more uh, more like the algebra stuff that that you'll see but again it's not totally disconnected from what we just covered so if you understood that 
that's solid ground to help you build upon. All right, so thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.